So the word heaven is used a limited number of times in Confucius, only 17, I believe, but it is often unclear just what he means, whether he's referring simply to the world of reality and in technical terms, whether he is transcendentalizing the imminent, i.e. the immanent, or simply making our world of nature and social reality seem to have another worldly dimension, while not in fact adding to it. Perhaps this vocabulary is simply characteristic of his time, and he felt the need to hang on to it, even though his focus is rigorously human, and is applied to the human qualities of benevolence and righteousness. Someone, sometimes one has to hang on to certain language if one is to be heard. So it falls to Mencius to develop the idea of heaven and give it his own specific imprint. He talks about the heavenly and the mandate of heaven quite a lot. This is something of a hot potato because some people want to save him from believing in the spiritual world, which transcends the present one. And so they want to understand the dimension of heaven as simply being an example of referring to perfection or a particularly exalted state of the world. In other words, they would prefer him to be a materialist and would prefer not to see him as somebody who is reaching for the world above for his explanations. The spectre of Platonic dualism hangs over this as Plato and the Platonists, and later the Christian Platonists, saw transcendent reality as the explanation of everything here below. Plato's theory of forms is just that. What we have here below is explained by a series of metaphysical entities above, which endows our world with its reality. There is a desire not to see Mencius in this light. The second point is that Mencius seems to talk about the possibility of regime change or revolt and the mandate of heaven or the endorsement of heaven being transferred to another regime. So the language of the mandate of heaven, Tianming, is potentially revolutionary. The mandate of heaven can be transferred in the case of rank injustice and transferred to a morally worthier opponent. So Mencius sits in a kind of battleground and revolutionary secularists, materialists and postmodernists would all like to claim him. There is a passage at Mencius 1b8 where he's asked about the removal of King Zhou by King Wu. And this passage is often seen as Mencius agreeing that revolutionary action may be carried out to remove a despot. In another passage, heaven appears to anoint a prince who is acceptable to the people, but again, Heaven does not speak, and the appropriateness of the ruler and the acceptance of the people is heaven silently producing what is. In some of the passages of Mencius, it's hard to tell what he means by heaven because sometimes it just sounds like the idea of fate. And sometimes he sounds as if He's just referring poetically to an ideal situation on earth. Reductionists would like to claim that he's really identifying the rule of heaven with the rule of the people. Now, let us look at Mencius on his own terms. 
Firstly, he is optimistic about human nature. As one of the major planks of his work is that each human being contains what he calls the four sprouts, sprouts of virtue. These are the green shoots. Again, note the presence of water as the nourisher and giver of life. And these green shoots may be encouraged to grow and develop or alternatively, they can be allowed to wither and die. There is a famous passage in Mencius 6a8, a beautiful passage, where he provides a description of the woods of Ox Mountain. This is a meditation on Ox Mountain. These woods were once a fine forest and next to a big city, uh, so the woodchoppers eventually cut them down. Are the woods still beautiful, asked Mencius. They might be chopped down, but the sprouts and the green shoots of the trees are still present, and the dew of the evening moistens them. But then the oxen and the sheep come and graze on the shoots, and that is why Ox Mountain is still so barren. People looking at this scene think that it has never been a forest or has never had these tree shoots on it. But how can this be? A human being has ren or humaneness naturally, says Mencius. But this capacity is lost because every morning the green shoots are consumed and cut down. The dew of the evening is there to help them grow but this is not enough if the outside forces come too quickly and cut them down. It is interesting to note in this story that the word for the evening dew is chi, again derived from water in Mencius' understanding, and is seen as a kind of life force which may yet be denied. His conclusion is as follows. Hence, given the right nourishment, there is nothing that will not grow. And deprived of it, there is nothing that will not wither away. Mencius says that a man who neglects his natural virtue and continually fails to respond to the dew provided in the evening mists will eventually come to resemble an animal, and people observing him will not see any capacity for virtue at all, just as those looking at Ox Mountain do not see any capacity for a forest to be there now. How graphic an observation this is. One cannot imagine a forest where there is nothing even though there may once have been a forest there. One grows used to sheep and oxen grazing on the remnants of it, and one sees it differently. Similarly, one can fail to recognize the potential of a human being when that human being has neglected his or her capacity for goodness. So we can see Mencius' optimism about human capacity, and this carries with it a corresponding duty for human beings to see to the nourishment of their fellow human beings. <clears throat> and there is a social capacity to improve human society and to cause it to progress. This leads us to a comment he makes on Tian, heaven, as follows, the organ of the heart can think, but it will find the answer only if it does think. Otherwise, it will not find the answer. This is what heaven has given me. If one makes one stand on what is of greater importance in the first instance, what is of smaller importance cannot usurp its place. In this way, one cannot but be a great man. 
So firstly, on the moral principle, we must take thought about what confronts us. And if on the bigger issues, we manage to do the right thing, then the small issues will not provide much challenge to us. The big issues of principle are the real challenge and they provide the toughest test, building our character so that the small issues simply fall into place. But what of the idea of heaven here? It certainly sounds like something above. Or it could possibly sound like the Stoic idea of providence coming from the Greeks and the Romans, providence or fate, an impersonal force which distributes good and evil along the way without fear or favour? Or is it just a poet, piece of poetry? When he says, this is what heaven has given me, does he just mean, this is what I have, this is how I am, this is all there is? There's also this passage from the Mencius 7a1. Mencius said, for a man to give full realization to his heart is for him to understand his own nature. And a man who understands his nature will know heaven. The retention of his heart and the nurturing of his nature are the means by which he serves heaven. Whether he is going to die young or live to a ripe old age, makes no difference to his steadfastness of purpose. It's through awaiting whatever is to befall him with a perfected character that he stands firm on his proper destiny. The heaven of this passage does not sound like a mere poetic echo from long gone beliefs, nor simply a rhetorical trope. It does sound like a reference to a state of perfection or a state of being which is not commonly found in this world. If I say otherworldly, then that sounds like postulating something like a transcendent Christian heaven or a platonic world of ideas or forms, as they were also called. This is a puzzle. If the Zhou dynasty claimed the mandate of heaven to legitimize their regime, having overthrown their predecessors, then they must have been claiming that something special had been given to them. It would not make much sense for them to overthrow the previous dynasty, then say, we now have the mandate of heaven. And by the way, all that means is that we have us, and you have us now. The example of the Greek and Roman Stoics may provide a better way of understanding with their sense that providence ruled the world of human affairs, or pronoia it was called, closely connected with the arch or vault built of the heavens which covered the earth. This idea of providence is not otherworldly. It is simply the cosmic process. And Mencius statement that we should simply await our fate with a perfected character. Self cultivation is always very important here. So this sounds very much like the ethic of a Roman Stoic philosopher. It is either providence or the atoms, said the Stoic Emperor Marcus Aurelius, in summing up the difference between the Stoics and the Epicureans. The difference between the random world of Epicurean atomic theory and the designed and planned world of providence. Providence which nevertheless had no favourites and was remorseless in the unfolding of its operations. 
This God of the Stoics, or this providence, is not a transcendent God, but an immanent one, immanent, the God which lay within the firmament, within the laws of physics, and within the process of the real. Perhaps we need some such idea to understand the heaven of Confucius and Mencius. Whatever we do, we should let them speak for themselves and endeavour to imaginatively insert ourselves into their world so as to be able to grasp how their thoughts worked. There is no need to make them fit into a contemporary worldview, since these are by nature temporary anyway. Thank you for joining me, and next time we will look at the idea of truth in Confucian tradition, and whether there is an idea of truth. Thank you.